Welcome. Today we are doing an introduction on ancient plagues. Now I know that sounds uh, tragic and um, sorrowful, but what we're going to be mostly focusing on in these and paying attention to is that plague is an agent of chaos, a very, very powerful one. And so we see things that we don't see in other places. We're going to see episodes of extreme hysteria. We're going to see these events shape the future of human civilization and the way in which these societies are going to be changed forever by these devastating events. There are going to be demons. There are going to be vampires. There are going to be false prophets and false gods. There's even going to be a fake Jesus Christ who would rather do things with a sword than with love and mercy and tolerance. There's going to be a fear of an undead uprising. There's going to be a lot of shenanigans occurring as we talk about these various plagues going forward. We're going to cover the Ananine Plague, the Cyprian Plague, the Justinian One, and of course the Black Death. As well as, you know, everything that goes along with that, that we just talked about. Now to introduce this, this ancient world of, 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 um, of plagues and how they interacted with it, we have to keep in mind that there's no better way to introduce the ancient world than to say that it is has a prodigious imagination. It was a time of gods, of magic, and monsters. It was this imagination that completely shaped the reality of the ancient mind. They were devoid of modern science, the scientific method, right? So, so this time, science is best described as, as, as humankind's best understanding to the world around it, okay? In this ancient time, bereft of complex understanding of existence, religion is going to be the uncontested science. With gods, demons, and magic, the dominant explanations for the unexplainable. And now if science is humankind's best understanding of the world around it, um, then religion is actually going to be the first attempt at science. And science, what we think of as harder science, is going to be the offspring of this endeavor. So religion is this tree that's going to bore the fruit of early civilization. Science ultimately was born from an attempt to understand the world that the gods had created. And magic and medicine were also its fruit, for they were an attempt at harnessing the power of the gods for healing. In the ancient world, religion, science, magic, medicine were not at odds, nor even independent of one another, but were in fact wholly and completely branches born of the same tree. Without the complex scientific understanding of the world we have today, logic and reasoning had to provide the answers. If something exists, therefore, you know, it was created, right? And therefore, there's a God. When the unexplainable occurred, the answer is often of supernatural origin. To understand the ancient mind, we must first ask this. When a plague occurred, what could be capable of causing this? We know that no man possesses such power to inflict this blight. It is therefore not the power of man, but of something greater. It is by this logic that a god is blamed, right, for this horror. And the affliction being punishment for some ill deed that someone did, or we as a society did. It is therefore logical that to end a plague, a god the God must be satisfied. Therefore, prayer, holy blessings, animal sacrifices, even scapegoating tactics were employed to satiate the wrath of the God. We're going to look at a, a tablet here, um, a host of tablets from the extinct city-state of Mori, which is in modern-day Syria. Um, Mori uh, 
this kingdom went extinct seventeen late uh, late seventeen hundreds BC. These tablets were written sometime in maybe eighteen hundred BC. We think. I'm going to read from this one. This is during a time of a plague in the city of Mari. The household of your servant Balu Gaim has been wiped out in Akulaba, or in a devouring of God. All his children died, right? No one remained sponsor for the household. And then he's going to actually proceed to try to be like get the, get the king to give him the house since everybody's dead there, right? So he's trying to profit off of this, this terror here. But, but listen to this. The household of your servant, Valu Gaim, has been wiped out in a devouring of God. Okay? A devouring of God. This is not a plague in these people's mind. This is not just a germ. This is not just an accident. Right? This, this, all this happening to them is not coincidence, right? Like it really is with, with an actual plague, right? And in our world, we understand that, that it's germs. Oh, I know how I got infected. I got exposed to it by, you know, not being, you know, just by happenstance, by bad luck, right? Well, that wasn't the thinking here, okay? I got exposed to this. What is happening to my body right now? All these soul, sores and bulbas. What is happening, Bubos, what is happening to me is God is devouring me. And God is devouring my neighbors. And God is devouring this entire town or city or country, right? And when we look at that, a God has devouring everyone, we're looking at something very apocalyptic in nature, right? Because when we take out the idea of this is circumstance, this is all bad luck, and no, it's God doing this, right? We have a completely different mentality about what's happening to us. So these people are, in their minds, are living in the actual, in an actual apocalyptic situation where a God is devouring them. Now, what, what these tablets indicate, in this case, it's a God, it's a God of justice or a plague God, such as Nurgle, who is doing this to them. Right, so this is an, an, for the ancient people, this these kind of plagues were an extra terrifying situation, right? An extra terrifying situation, um, because their right their reasoning for it is is a lot more sinister and, and, and scary. Now we're going to look at how this was was they tried to cure this plague. Right, a wizard right is going to come to a town, right? Um, um, and he's going to say, there will be consumption, as in there's going to be eating here. The God is going to feast on you. Require the many towns to return consecrated objects, right? Return the holy objects. Anyone having committed assault must be expelled from the city, right? So get rid of all the bad guys, get rid of all the evil people, kick them out of the city, get them out. Um, and and return all holy objects, and you will be spared of the devouring of God, right, of the plague. Um, so we can see some of the actions, right, that they took, uh, more holy-type actions they, they took back then to try to get rid of this stuff. But it's not only gods capable of inflicting such horror, but demons as well. Plague was such a part of ancient life, that Mesopotamians had created the concept of plague gods, one of them being Nurgle. This evolved in later years to the concept of a plague demon, a rapacious infector and spreader of disease. Now from Babylon we see a piece of an exorcism ritual meant to cast out a plague demon from the body of the victim, which we'll now read from. It is I who recite the incantation for the sick man, whether thou be an evil spirit or an evil demon, or an evil ghost or an evil devil, or an evil god or an evil fiend, or sickness or death or phantom of the night, or wraith of the night, or disease or pestilence. Be thou removed from me before me. By heaven be thou exercised. By earth be thou exercised. Unto the man the son of his god come not nigh. Get thee hence. 
By heaven be thou exercised, by earth be thou exercised. Here we witness in ancient Greece a an instance of a plague demon using its host, the, the one it has possessed, um, to spread plague at the ancient city of Ephesus. This event can be seen as a literal scapegoating of a patient zero, right? The wizard Apollonius had been summoned by the people of Ephesus to end the plague. Now, when reaching the city, the wizard Apollonius found what appeared to be an old beggar contriving to squint. He carried a wallet and a morsel of bread in it. He was dressed in rags and had a squalid face. Apollonius grouped the Ephesians around the beggar and said, Collect as many stones as you can and throw them at this enemy of the gods. Ephesians were taken aback by this instruction and thought it terrible to kill a stranger with such an unfortunate condition. The beggar himself was beseeching Apollonius and begged for pity, but the wizard was insistent and urged the Ephesians to get on with the job and not let the man go. When some of the people began to pelt him with stones, the man who had been pretending to be squinting suddenly looked up and showed that his eyes were full of fire. The Ephesians then recognized that he was a demon, and so they stoned him to death so thoroughly that they built up a heap of stones over him. And later, actually, a um, a statue of Heracles is going to be erected, right, um, at that site. So we see there that, you know, this, this plague demon is treated as a spreader of disease, as a patient zero, if you will, and that um, the demonic is spreading this disease in some explanations. The other, right, and this is... We'll just talk about here with magic, but it's magic in the ancient world was ultimately and was the harnessing of the power of the gods. That's what it was. And if the power of the gods could cause a plague, right, magic, therefore, could summon a plague. Witches and sorcery would there be, therefore be suspected as origins of plague as well. Now, this didn't start any, like, massive witch hunt or witch fervor, but we're going to see an example in the next video where, in the Ananine Plague, where, you know, there's going to be a witch's dolls in the town and they're going to burn them all because they're afraid that's where the plague's coming from. So, um, they're not going around killing a ton of witches. If something like this, someone was suspected, it would be a more of a scapegoating incident where one witch would be killed rather than, you know, hundreds. What did ancient people know about medicine, about these kind of things, right? And how to deal with the plague, because they are going to catch on to some of these things. And I'm going to read from um, a verse here from a tablet. And my Lord must give instructions and inhabitants of any cities that are infected must not enter cities that are not infected. Right? I am afraid they will infect the land, all of it. Right? So they are aware, right? even in Mori, that's where that verse was from, in 1800 BC, the very first written evidence we have of a plague, right? this devouring of God, they are aware of, of, of a basic procedure like quarantine. Right? They are aware that the infection can spread right? from person to person. It can transmit itself. Here's another verse. The king of Mari here is going to tell his wife, Since she is often at the palace, it will infect the many women who are with her. Now give strict orders. No one is to drink from the cup she uses. No one is to sit on the seat she takes. No one is to lie on the bed she uses, lest it infect the many women who are with her. This is a very contagious infection. Right, so, like I said, 1800 B.C., they are already aware of that this can be spread via contact, right? That illnesses can be spread via contact, via using it, whether it be contact with a uh, germed object, right? Or a, uh, a, a cursed object, if you will, right? That has been an, an infected object. There we go. An infected object, right? A cup, sit on the chair that she was sitting on, that sort of thing. They're aware of these things. Now, how are they aware of these things so early on? 
And that's a great question to ask because what we're essentially saying is by, by looking at this, 1800 BC, the very first written evidence of a plague, that they already have a good idea on how to deal with these things, quarantining procedures for both towns, infected towns, and infected people. It's going to say several things. One, ancient people were not stupid, okay? They may not have had the science we had, but they weren't stupid. I mean, they could figure some things out. Two, it tells us that mankind has dealt with plagues and epidemics for an extremely long period of time in order for them to have already developed this kind of knowledge by 1800 BC. It must have gone way, way back. We can look at the book of Leviticus from the Bible, the Old Testament, um, to this line here. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear, t wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean, right? So they had to rip their clothes, make their hair crazy um, so that people would know what they were and to stay away from them. Now, this Bible verse is, we believe it's referring specifically to leprosy, uh, victims of leprosy, which was not contagious the way they thought it was back then. Um, but it goes to show you that with diseases that you know they believed to be contagious, that they needed to cover their face, right? The lower part of their face to keep air from coming out. This goes along with the theory of miasma or miasma, right? This is um, Hippocrates was the one who posited this theory, but honestly, it probably goes further back than that. But generally speaking, the, the belief went that there's something in the air that is causing our sickness. And it's posited that there are bad smells and that's the cause of it. So, you know, if you, you don't wanna be around uh, feces a ton because that smell could get you sick. You don't wanna be around dead people because that smell could get you sick. Um, and you don't wanna be around sick people because unfortunately a lot of these diseases cause rotting of the flesh and um, Thank God we don't really have these anymore, but a lot of the, the ancient diseases would, would cause such things to happen. And so a victim or suffering from uh, many different various types of plagues would stink and reek of death um, and of rotting. And so the theory of miasma told people, oh, I, I can't be near them. That smell is dangerous. That will get me sick, right? So... It's a good it's a good theory that actually does kind of protect people in a way, right? Now, m the theory of miasma, right, is so close to germ theory. It's so close, right? The difference here being that, you know, there are actually germs in the air, and that's what's causing it rather than a smell, right? Um, but, you know, and germ theory is not going to become a, an accepted theory till 1861, all right? The thing is, is that many people came up with germ theory long before 1861. One of the earliest I found was a fellow named Marcus Terentius Varro, which was a, a Roman, wrote in 36 BC not to build one's farm near a swamp for the following reason. Because certain minute animals, invisible to the eye, breed there and born by the air, reach inside of the body by way of the mouth and nose and cause diseases which are difficult to be rid of, right? So he is aware, or he is positive this theory that there are germs. There are these little tiny invisible creatures in the air that float around, they get in you and they infect you with an illness, which is what germs are, right? And he came up with it in 36 BC. Now, very successful of him. Here's the problem. He couldn't finish the deal. He couldn't convince everybody that he was right. That's a very key part of when you invent something or come up with a new theory is convincing people it's the correct one. And believe it or not, many people in the future would come up with germ theory. It just wouldn't end up being accepted. All right. The other predominant medical theory from the ancient world was humorism. And I don't, I don't mean a joke. 
Um, it's a little bit of a joke, but um, it's the belief, right? This was Hippocrates also posed this theory. It probably goes back further than him. Um, but the belief that the body had four humors, that is fluids of the body, one being blood, the other being mucus or spit, the other being urine and, and poop is the fourth one, right? So the idea here is, is if someone is having a lot of bowel movements, then something is wrong with their humors, right? They're out of balance. They're out of whack because they're going to the bathroom so much. And so the way to fix them is to stop them going to the bathroom so much, right? So something is wrong with the humors and, you know, because they're some, either they're bleeding, either they're, you know, they're urinating constantly or they're, you know, they're going to the bathroom a lot or they're spitting up stuff and snot and mucus is coming out of them. Therefore, one of their four humors is out of balance and that has to be corrected and back into balance and then they'll be healthy again. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> both that, right, the belief in humorism and the uh, belief in the theory of miasma is going to be the dominant belief into all the way into the late 1800s and early 1900s AD. Okay, so these these Middle Eastern thoughts on medicine, these Greek thoughts on medicine are going to go with us uh, for you know, 2,500 years, right, or further, unfortunately, until we're able to figure out how to really actually what is causing illnesses. When it came to actual medicine, now this is, this is, this is the hard part, is like calling it actual medicine. And I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, oh, the ancient people were aware of certain herbs, right? Or they were, oh, they figured out that this thing actually did have healing properties or, or whatever. The problem with that kind of thinking is that I have not yet seen a medical prescription or potion of which ingredients would actually be beneficial, frankly. There might be one ingredient in there that's decent. Right, but the problem is, is you don't know the dosage, right? And the dosage may be different from patient to patient. And when you don't know the dosage, it's very quickly, it's very easy to turn a, a what could be medicine into a poison. The second thing is they might add something beneficial, some plant matter that would be beneficial to a sick person, but then they add a bunch of other stuff that's not beneficial and is in fact uh, unbeneficial or will make a person worse. Below is an assortment of ancient medical remedies from the ancient world. This is a prescription for curing the pestilence in ancient Sumer. Fashion a figure of him in dough, put water upon the man and pour forth the water of the incantation. Bring forth a censer and a torch as the water trickle away from his body, so may the pestilence in his body trickle away. All right, so they've basically they're. If I understand right, there's a voodoo doll here. They're transferring the illness of plague to the doll from the actual human to the doll they made of him. Here's some more. These are from ancient Greece. Country folk have found out through experience that a person suffering severely from a tumor gains relief if he eats a snake. Cut the foot off a live hare and remove the fur from its belly. Then let the hare go free. Make a strong thread out of the fur and use it to tie the foot to the sick person's body. This produces a miraculous cure. There you have it. Potentially the origin of the lucky rabbit's foot. He ate camel's heels and crests of roosters cut off while they were still alive, as well as the tongues of peacocks and nightingales, for it is said that anyone who ate them would be safe from the pestilence. So there you go, a cure for plague prevention, the tongues of peacocks and nightingales, as well as cutting off the crest of roosters and eating them. It is said that seizures can be prevented by eating the brains of a vulture, the uncooked heart of a seagull, or a domestic ferret. Right, so 
I'm going to eat the heart of a ferret, and that's going to cure me from ever having a seizure again. All right. As you can see, the magic or the medicine from around this time um, was not very effective. There's actually even an episode in the plague of Athens where all of these people have a terrible fever. Um, you know, we're talking 105, 106 fever. They feel like their fever is so bad, they feel like their skin and their brain is on fire. The solution of the doctors in Athens was to create a great bonfire and then place these victims next to it, and then that would heal them. That just made them so much worse. If you know anything about people having a fever, um, then you know you don't want to try to make them hotter. You want to try to cool them down. So, a very, very serious lack of, of, of medical knowledge during this time. They were obviously trying to get it right, to do these things, but completely incomparable to, to modern medicine and the knowledge we have today. Um, and it's certainly going to be completely helpless against an actual plague, something like smallpox or typhus or bubonic plague. In order to understand the true power of plague, we must first understand that plague often brings with it other calamities, and it often brings many, many calamities with it. It is a powerful agent of chaos. It is one of the most powerful agents of chaos in human history. Some would even argue the most powerful agent. When we look at the Bible, <clears throat> the book of Exodus, and we think of the ten plagues of Egypt, it's not just one calamity, right? There are ten plagues, ten plagues, right? So in the biblical story, water turns to blood. The people are attacked by frogs, then by locusts, by wild animals, and by flies. Next, the livestock and the animals die and festering boils then break out upon people. Thunderstorms and fire occur, fire followed by three days of darkness and the death of the firstborn children. Now, that's a lot, right? But truthfully, that kind of thing happens with a lot of these plagues that we're going to talk about over the course of this. You could easily call the Justinian plague, the ten plagues of Byzantium, right? Or um, the, the Cyprian plague, the ten plagues of Rome. In fact, some authors even do that. Um, so it just goes to show you that the way plague travels with numerous other tragedies. And the reason this occurs is we think about plague and it killing so many people it doesn't just target one specific person or one specific class of people. It gets everybody. It gets the farmers. Well, then you have no you have no one to cultivate the crops, and there's no crops. Everybody starves, right? When the, all the sailors die, or many of them die, there's no one to go get help and get trade and bring food back and water back into the city. They're dead, right? So it brings about a terrible famine, and ensuing starvation. All these trade workers, carpenters, everybody, people who make clothes, um, things we think about it as, as being less important, they're going to die too. And when that happens, all of a sudden the price of goods goes way up. right? And this is particularly important with the farmers. right? They're not able to bring in as much, as much grain and other things. The sailors, the fishermen aren't able to bring in as much fish because they're less fishermen. All of a sudden, the price of those things goes way, way up. And all of a sudden, the lower classes, which is, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the population, can no longer afford to buy food, right? And so then you have an immense starvation going, occurring. So these events, these plagues, diseases, bring with them many, many other calamities. And that's, that's a lesson we can take away from the book of Exodus, when we look at other plagues, the plague of Athens is going to occur. That's going to kill a ton of people. When we look at 
the end of the Bronze Age period. There's a plague going around. It's likely smallpox. The several pharaohs appear to have died of it, uh, including much of the Egyptian royal family um, at the time appears to have died of smallpox. So there is a plague going around that is is causing a lot of death at the end of the Bronze Age, which we, as we know, there's a Bronze Age collapse, right? A lot of these civilizations, these former powerhouses go away. We can't say that's due to plague because we don't have the evidence and there's just so much other stuff going on there. <clears throat> but um, suffice to say, plague likely contributed in some part to the Bronze Age collapse. Now, because plague is such a time of chaos, such an agent of chaos, we have to understand that chaos brings the destruction of order. And if order cannot provide an answer to that chaos, the ill-intentioned will happily provide answers of their own. Charlatans, false prophets, as well as all sorts of medical quackery run rampant in a time of plague. The truth was there was no stopping plague in ancient times. There was no repulsing the tide of death. That was the truth. And when the truth becomes unsatisfactory, the lie becomes irresistible. So with the destruction of order comes disorder, and with it, disinformation. In our readings of the ancient world, we're going to see lots of charlatans, fake healers, false prophets, even fake gods uh, that attempt to take advantage of this collapse of order and are only going to promulgate the chaos and the number of people dying of these plagues. And we're going to see this chaos on full display in our next video on the Antonine Plague, a event so devastating that the Roman Empire would never fully recover. In this time, we're also going to see a ventriloquist act, this false god, lead thousands and thousands of people to their deaths. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and that you'll tune in for the next one. Thanks for watching.